Hello, um, I am Edwina Brown. Um, I work in London and I am president of the ISPD. So welcome to this INISPD webinar on urgent start peritoneal dialysis. The two speakers uh, are both experts in this field. Um, Brett Cullis is a consultant nephrologist in South Africa who is also president of um, Saving Young Lives, um, and he has a lot of experience in urgent start peritoneal dialysis. Elaine Bowes uh, is a colleague of mine in London. She is a um, specialist nurse who has really um, uh, championed um, nurses putting in um, percutaneous peritoneal dialysis catheters to make urgent start PD um, a feasible um, choice. Uh, and she has already presented on these webinars uh, talking about the, uh, the acute kidney injury of COVID, which she managed um, on the ITUs um, at King's Hospital in London with peritoneal dialysis. So while we're waiting for everybody um, to join in on the webinar and they're logging in. Um, there is a poll, um, there's a quiz um, question on your screen about a 38 year old man presenting with uremic symptoms, fluid overload, um, small kidneys, um, hypertensive uh, with uh, the blood tests that you can see. Um, and I want you to just um, fill in which of the various options you, you agree with. So only about a quarter of you th think that urgent start PD um, could be first choice management for this um, patient. Uh, easily over a half, so about two thirds of you would be starting the patient on hemodialysis um, and about 10% on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, in most places, urgent um, PD catheter insertion is not possible. Um, and again, most of you are, are not comfortable with um, inpatient management of acute PD in your hospital. So we've got a lot to um, cover in, in this webinar. Uh, and let's hand over to um, Brett Cullis from South Africa, who also authored the um, ISPD guideline on use of PD um, for acute kidney injury. Thank you, Brett. Thanks very much, Edwina. And thanks to ISPD and ISN for inviting me to, to talk today um, on Urgent Start PD. Um, it is something very much close to my heart. Um, and I'm gonna start off just talking about the rationale for Urgent Start PD, um, some of the practicalities but then Elaine is gonna talk very much how, how to actually go about it and how to do it in your center. So we first need to just remember that urgent star patients come in many shapes and forms, and you can have anything from the acute kidney injury patient on the left-hand side in ICU, who's got multi-organ failure, um, very high catabolic rate, and that's at the one end. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the late presenting CKD patient, just like we've seen in the, in the quiz now, who arrives at the unit, maybe as an outpatient. And, and how we manage these patients is gonna be slightly different to, depending on the acuity of the patient. But if we look at the AKI patients, certainly we know that there is good evidence that acute kidney injury can be treated um, with acute PD. These are five studies looking at ICU patients treated with, a, with, with AKI with acute PD. Um, two of the studies um, were randomized studies, one from Saudi Arabia, one from Brazil, um, looking at, at patients in ICU with between 60 and 80% of patients ventilated, um, around about 70% of them on vasopressor support as well. So extremely ill patients, and yet outcomes were comparable between acute PD and hemodialysis or CVVHDF in the Saudi Arabian study. So certainly these very ill patients can be treated with it. And we looked at the evidence base and the ISPD guidelines both in 2015 and 2020, and the Cochrane collaboration have also looked at this. And the, the conclusion from both our, um, our 
review, as well as the Cochrane review, is that based on moderate levels of evidence, mortality and recovery of kidney function does appear to be equivalent between extracorporeal therapies and, and acute PD. So certainly the, the most acutely ill patients can be treated with acute PD. So why then can't we treat the patient that comes in as a late presenting CKD patient with um, urgent start PD? Now we need to define what is urgent start PD and what's early start PD, because anyone who starts PD within two weeks of having their catheter put in is, is really an early starting patient. And Peter Blake wrote this review in CJSON about four years ago, but was really trying to define the two different groups that we see, because the urgent start patient is the one who comes in acutely unwell, um, and we're starting them on acute PD without them having any, any form of hemodialysis. Whereas an early start patient, someone who starts at 12 days after they've had their PD catheter in, may well be a very different kettle of fish. So we try and divide them between urgent start and early start. We're going to talk predominantly about the urgent start patients in this webinar. Now, we all have these crash landing patients that arrive at our door, and it happens all over the world. This is my first urgent start PD patient, and you can see he presented with a sodium of 108, um, an extremely high creatinine in urea. And unfortunately, we didn't have CVVHDF at, at our hospital, so we had no way of, um, we could only use intermittent hemodialysis, and I was worried about the, raising that sodium too quickly. So he was the first patient we actually treated with urgent start PD. And here you can see him at PD clinic um, a couple of months later. He did exceptionally well starting with urgent start PD. And um, I'm sure you can agree that this is probably the worst you're gonna see. So late referral of patients occurs, as I say, all over the world. This is taken from the UK renal registry showing that around about 25% of patients are presenting very late. This is a, a study done um, in the East of London unit, and they were again looking at, at urgent starters and what was the cause for them coming in as urgent starters. And you can see of the 755 patients who presented needing dialysis, um, about a third of them needed an unplanned start on dialysis. This study out of South Korea, also comparing planned versus unplanned <coughs> starters, you can see um, a very high number of patients, proportion of the patients are actually um, starting as urgent start patients, um, around about half of the patients in the study. This is taken from Edwina Brown's group um, from West of London. And again, they were looking at the patients who were presenting as unplanned starters or urgent starters on dialysis and looking at what, what were the causes? Why were these patients presenting um, late and not, sta not starting in a planned manner? And you can see around about 50% of them either started unplanned or as urgent starters. Unplanned meant they weren't known to the, to the service. Um, urgent starters were those that were known to the service but had suddenly deteriorated. And this was largely due to systemic illness that came around or an unexpected um, decline in kidney function. So it, it happens. So how do we deal with it? We know that also if these patients that are late presenting patients do have a higher mortality associated with this. And this is a, a slightly old Cochrane review, um, but you can see that even up to five years, those patients that have, are late referral patients um, have an increased mortality. So this is the, really the start of urgent start PD. Although it was done and an acute PD was done for many, many years prior to this um, back in the eighties, but this was the first paper that really looked at, at defining urgent start PD patients. And it was done um, in Denmark by Paulson and Iverson. And what they did was these were patients who were started on urgent start PD. The catheters were put in by surgeons and they weren't percut percutaneously placed catheters. Um, and they had a defined treatment protocol. So if they were less than 60 kgs, they would do APD overnight for 12 hours. Um, a dwell volume of 1.2 liters and quite a high tidal volume. So 50 to 75% tidal volume. If they were um, more than 60 kgs, they had a bigger um, fill volume. And what you can see is that technique survival between these two groups um, was, was, largely, was largely similar, whether they were an acute start patient or a planned start patient. What was important though, is that complication rates were much higher in the acute start patients. And you'll see this in all the studies that I'm gonna look at and that these patients do have complications, but don't let those put you off doing unplanned start PD. 
because patients who start in hemodialysis also have complications. It's the patient who's coming in as a late presenting patient that's going to have complications, whether they do acute PD or, or acute HD. There have been a number of studies subsequent to this Paulson study um, looking at urgent start PD, um, and they're listed here nicely in this, in this review, um, again showing that complication rates in urgent start PD patients are slightly higher. So what are the benefits of urgent start or unplanned start PD? Firstly, patients are able to access their therapy of choice. We might use fewer um, temporary catheters, and this may equate to less morbidity or mortality. There are implications if your unit is being um, tested as to how many um, catheters your patients are dialyzing with, and there are implications from a cost-saving point of view. But who's the most important person in the room? It's the patient. What do patients want? What do patients need? And these are three of my patients, um, who, or sorry, two of my patients, um, on PD, showing that their quality of life was significantly better on PD than, on, on, than what they would have achieved on hemodialysis. And we know that if patients are given a choice of dialysis modality, the vast majority of them will choose a home-based therapy, and around about 50% of those patients um, will choose to do peritoneal dialysis. And these are three studies just looking at um, when patients are actually given education and a choice um, the proportion of patients choosing PD or home therapy. We as nephrologists also, if we were given the choice of, or if we ended up on dialysis, would choose to do a home therapy in the vast majority of cases. The top left-hand corner was um, in a, um, at a nephrology conference. Nurses and doctors were, were asked what modality would they choose, and around 90% would choose a home therapy, and that was about a 50-50 split between home hemo and PD. Um, the other studies, um, top right, about 64% of, of nephrologists would choose peritoneal dialysis for themselves. 70% in Saudi Arabia would choose PD. Um, and in France, again, around about 80% of people would choose a home therapy, with a majority of those choosing PD. The problem is that if you're a late plan, or an unplanned starter on PD, the chance, as unplanned starter, sorry, on dialysis, the chance of you actually getting onto PD is significantly lower. And this is, a, again, looking at that Cochrane review from 2011, showing that you're far more likely to go onto hemodialysis than PD if you're a late presenting patient. If we again um, look at the study from the West of London unit, here you can see around 16% of patients in the planned starter group started on PD, whereas none of the patients in the unplanned start um, started on or went on to PD. So if, you, if, you, if you're an urgent starter, generally you're going to end up on hemodialysis. And why is this? Well, the patients, once they've started on hemodialysis, it's very difficult to convince them to change to hemodialysis, especially if they've spent a, a fair amount of time on the dialysis machine. It's very scary for them to change. Um, the thought of having another procedure um, is also quite scary. So, so patients tend to stick with what they know. Going back to the South Korean study, again, where they had around about half the patients were unplanned starters. If they were a planned start, around 58% of patients went on to PD, whereas only 6% of patients in the unplanned starter group did. So we want patients to go into the modality of choice. What about complications? So we know that, that having a dialysis catheter does equate with increased mortality. And there's a number of reasons behind this. Um, some of it may actually have to do with just the patient group that end up getting catheters. But the regist US registry, as well as the ANS data um, on the left and the right, show that your mortality is significantly higher if you'd start your dialysis with a catheter and your infectious mortality goes up significantly. This older study from um, C. Jason, again, looking at patients with acute catheters, tunnel catheters versus permanent access, again showing your risk of being admitted to hospital was four times higher if you had a catheter than if you had permanent access. So if we do acute PD, can we avoid these patients having a, a hemodialysis catheter and does that equate to better outcomes? So this is a study from Thierry Lobedez group in, in the south of France. And these are, this is a cohort study, but they looked at uh, urgent start PD patients versus urgent start hemodialysis patients, 34 and 26 in each of the groups. The black circles are the hemodialysis patients, and mortality was slightly higher for them with the hemodialysis group compared to the urgent start PD group, 
Although if you look at comorbidities, the, the hemo group were, um, had higher comorbidity index um, compared to the PD group. But what you can see in that first six months is there does seem to be a little bit of a split between the two groups. And one wonders whether there's any impact of the dialysis access there um, and whether catheters may have some impact. This is taken from Cox Group in Germany, and they compared 57 hemo patients versus 66 PD patients. And you can see bacteremia rates were significantly higher in the hemodialysis group. Whereas if you look at peritonitis rates further down, actually there was no significant, there was no difference between the two groups, whether they got whether on the hemo group or the PD group. This is um, out of China, again, looking at 178 patients, comparing urgent start PD versus urgent start hemodialysis. Catheter-related infection was, signif was significantly higher in the HD group, and your risk of having a short-term dialysis-related complication was five times higher if you started on urgent start hemodialysis compared to urgent start PD. Having said that, mortality was no different between the two groups. This is a study out of Brazil from um, Daniela Ponce's group, and they looked at their urgent start versus PD versus hemodialysis patients. And you can see again, catheter-related bacteremia was significantly higher in the, in the hemodialysis group. But also what is interesting is recovery of renal function, although not significant, did seem to be higher in the patients on urgent start PD. And diuresis at six months was significantly higher in the patients on PD. And certainly if we can protect residual renal function, we know that that has an impact on outcomes. So maybe starting patients on urgent start PD might actually protect that residual renal function in the late presenting patient. It's just for thought. This is the only randomized controlled trial and it was published this year by um, Watanya Parapabun in, in Thailand. Now in Thailand, they have, an, they have a PD first policy. So all patients go on to PD in the first instance but they randomized patients to either starting with urgent start PD, or they would start with hemodialysis for two weeks, and then they would change over between two and four weeks over to PD. And they showed that your composite um, complication rate, um, and that was catheter-related complications, operation-related complications, and dialysis-related complications were significantly higher in the hemodialysis group compared to the urgent start PD group. Um, interestingly, operation-related complications, no different between the two groups. Um, one of the big differences was intradialytic hypotension, um, which was seen in the urgent start hemodialysis group. There was actually no bacteremia in either groups, and this is um, obviously testament that they had very good outcomes from an infection point of view, but there was no, no infection in either group, so it, you couldn't estimate a difference between bacteremia rates. What about meta-analyses? This is um, first meta-analysis looking at the cohort and um, case control studies looking at urgent start PD versus planned PD. Um, in the, the first is technique survival. And you can see between urgent start and planned PD, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Um, interestingly, it, it favored the urgent start PD group, but this might be publication bias. When you look at mortality, um, there was probably a trend towards better outcomes in planned PD patients, and that's not surprising. We know that unplanned starters tend to have a worse mortality. What we did see, though, is that catheter leakage and mechanical complications were higher in the unplanned starters, um, and that is what I was saying earlier. You need to expect that you are going to have complications. Don't be put off. Don't, don't get despondent if you have the odd complication. It is to be expected. Finally, uh, the Cochrane collaboration, Tay Tay from um, Singapore, um, did two Cochrane reviews, first in 2020 and 2021, comparing urgent start PD versus hemodialysis and urgent start PD versus planned PD. So this is looking at urgent start hemodialysis versus urgent start peritoneal dialysis. On the left is hemodialysis, on the right is peritoneal dialysis. And you can see bacteremia rates significantly higher in the urgent start hemodialysis group. Peritonitis rates, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Um, and technique survival was very similar between the two groups um, later on. Catheter malfunction rate was actually much lower in the PD group compared to the hemodialysis group. And this was largely because catheters had to be replaced because they blocked um, and weren't working. When they compared um, unstand, unplanned start PD versus conventional start PD, yes, dialysate leak rate was higher, albeit non-significant. Catheter blockage um, was actually fairly similar between the two groups, 
Mole position was higher. These patients aren't prepped before they go to theater and may well be having catheters placed percutaneously. Peritonitis rates were no difference between the two groups. And interestingly, technique survival was pretty much similar between the two groups. So unplanned start is a good option. It's a great way of starting patients on, P on dialysis. And if they are going to be on PD long-term, why not start them on, on PD in the first instance rather than putting them through hemodialysis? Finally, just looking at cost, this was an analysis of cost in the US. And they looked at PD, unstand, unplanned start PD patients versus hemodialysis patients versus those patients who started um, with a line and then moved on to PD. And you can see it was $16,000 um, for an urgent start PD patient, whereas around $19,000 um, versus an urgent start hemo patient or patient starting with hemo and then moving on to PD. So what are the processes involved in setting up your urgent start PD program? We need to identify the appropriate patient. Make sure that you're not putting patients onto PD that shouldn't be on PD. Education given to the patient, but also to the carers, because often these patients are uremic and they can't make a decision themselves. It sometimes needs to be done with the patient's carer um, or loved ones. You then make the decision to choose PD as a modality, insert the catheter and start the PD. And that's largely what, what Elaine is going to talk about in a minute. I just want to show you the one thing that is really, really important. Um, and we found this in our unit in Exeter. We started patients on, on, on um, hemodialysis routinely when they came in as unplanned starters. And when we looked at, analyzed those unplanned starters, none of them ever went on to PD. We then introduced an urgent, urgent um, crash lander clinic, um, but also early nurse education. The nurse education started from day one that the patients arrived in the unit. And you can see it's significantly higher numbers of patients ended up on PD and this has continued and was shown in the options study, which is run by Baxter, but showing that those patients that get early education, um, a significantly, significant number of those patients will actually end up on PD long-term compared to what I showed you earlier where um, these unplanned starters generally don't. The other thing to remember is that you don't, uh, you, 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 you might have a patient that is not, you're not sure. Should they do PD? Shouldn't they do PD? It's, it's not a problem if you do start them on a bit of hemodialysis beforehand. Let them get over the uremia, make a decision, um, and then move on to, on to their, their modality of choice. Um, this is taken from, from a Polish group, um, but this is the protocol they use. So you know, put it together for, in the best way for the patient. Don't have only one, one size fits all. Think about the patients. Um, and try and get them onto, onto a program. So this is a, a very nice review and you can, um, you can read it in Kidney360, um, just looking at, at the, what is needed for setting up your um, urgent start PD program. But a lot, of, a lot of stuff needs to be done early on. Um, you do need to have a multidisciplinary team uh, made up of nurses, surgeons, interventionists, um, who can, can make sure that the patients have a smooth th flow through getting onto the dialysis program. And make sure that you've got nursing staff who are trained in urgent start PD. Make sure that you've got protocols set up so that people know what you're going to be doing. Um, and make sure that you've got the ability to follow up these patients as they leave hospital to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks because they are high risk patients um, because of the way that they're starting on dialysis. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Elaine um, and she's going to talk through the practicalities. So now that Brett has no doubt convinced you that urgent PD is a good idea and there's a very practical way of treating um, unplanned or unheralded patients on, on dialysis, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the practicalities and the how-to. So we have talked a little bit about the different treatment regimens and the most important thing to say about urgent start PD is that it doesn't always have to be automated peritoneal dialysis. It is, CAPD can just as easily and just as usefully be used for um, urgent start PD. The most important thing to do is to get your dwell volume correct. And so actually thinking about the size of the patient, the capacity of the patient, and in prevention of leaks, things that can be useful are tidal volumes so that the patient won't get drain pain so that they have some of their well volume remaining in such as 20% or 30%, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and also the actual volume that you are doing. So small and rapid volumes um, and, more, and more 
dwells and exchanges can work better than just um, small amounts. I think it's really useful to think about your APD machine as a, a bit like a CVVHD machine. So you don't, you, can, you don't only use an APD machine for eight hours. You can use it for up to 22 hours as we did during COVID in ICU. Um, and really thinking about the patient as an individual and looking at how you might consider um, the different regimen and how that should be. The other thing is to prevent leaks, the patient needs to be nursed in a supine position. And that will be achieved simply by ensuring that you have spoken to the patient, their relatives, the team on the ward, and anybody who is caring for the patient at that time. So we have looked a little bit at these clinical outcomes. And what I would say about complications, yes, certainly complications can happen with urgent start PD. However, as long as you follow very strict guidance, and as long as you really consider how that catheter is placed, the volumes of PD fluid that you're going to use during your um, prescri prescribing, and also good communication with the teams, all, all or many of these complications can be avoided. Um, and as you can see, um, dialysis leaks tend to be one of the main um, complications. And I'm very pleased to say that we did manage to treat many patients in ICU without that, that catheter leak. And we very rarely see catheter leaks. And I'm gonna show you how we manage that here at King's. So we have looked a little bit at why we might use um, Urgent Start PD. Um, and Brett has kindly um, allowed me to share this. And this is just really looking at that multi-organ failure AKI. Certainly, patients who absolutely crash land in the unit. We should consider every patient who crash lands as to whether um, urgent start PD would be a better option for them in the short term and also in the longer term. As I've said, um, tidal APD is really very useful, small volumes, and we usually start about 1200 mils because that tends to be the best, um, the best volume for most patients, but do consider the size of the patient. And we can start as little with patients who may have polycystic kidney disease, or it may have a very small body habitus. We can go down as far as 700 or 500 mil volumes with some tidal. So, it is important also to consider how you're going to manage the patient. We certainly do not want to block up um, inpatient beds with um, urgent start PD patients. And we don't need to if we can use things such as assisted PD and in intermittent um, tidal APD within an outpatient area or a tertiary area. Um, and training does not need to start immediately. And I would suggest that your training starts once the patient's exit site has healed, because that will help you to prevent exit site infections in the future. As Brett has mentioned, the prescri prescription is really determined by the acuity of the patient. We need to be sure that the patient understands that one, while they're dwelling, they should be in a supine position. And, the, and this, once the patient understands what might happen, and you literally explain what a leak is and how it can prevent them from dialyzing for a couple of days because you may need to rest the catheter. Bowel prep is really useful. And for the most part, even in the most acute patient, that can be given prior to the catheter being inserted. Because of course, if you do give two doses of Citrofleet, for instance, your potassium will reduce quite rapidly. Um, and then when you start dialyzing the patient, you can do that within an hour of the catheter being placed. All of these things can be achieved, but again, as Brett has alluded, it is really important to have a good thorough pathway um, and a very defined pathway within the unit. Um, CAPD can absolutely be sometimes more effective than APD. And if you have started a patient on urgent start APD and you're having problems, consider a switch to CAPD and even two hourly um, um, cycles can have a good effect on the patient um, as long as you have the um, support of the ward team and the acute team wherever the patient may be. Education is continuous, should be throughout, and I would agree that formal training should take place after five to seven days. Exit site training should be left until actually that exit site is healed, and for me I would like to wait 21 days for that. So as we have spoken about, urgent start peritoneal dialysis is a really powerful tool in AKI. And this is just a, a 
a small graph just to show you exactly what we achieved during COVID when we were treating our patients for AKI. The reason we could do this is because we were using our assisted team to actually come into the hospital and, this, and help us. We also were, we had also completed many urgent start PD patients um, and crash landers uh, within the unit. And that gave us the expertise to actually manage those very unwell um, COVID patients. So it is absolutely possible to do urgent start PD with a general anesthetic inserted catheter, um, laparoscopic technique um, with very minimal, a minimally invasive technique. That is absolutely possible to do. So do consider that. But certainly percutaneous um, insertions using cell dinger technique and, and hopefully using some ultrasound guidance if, if you need um, can can be very useful in, in, in ensuring that as many patients as possible have the option. Why, why are they so useful? You don't need a general anesthetic. You can support that challenge of timing and timing is everything in an urgent start PD. Um, you, there isn't a need for admission unless the patient is already uh, admitted. You can improve the patient's experience simply by ensuring that the same team are seeing the patient throughout and also that the patient has the choice of dialysis because many patients do want to remain working and to remain at home and PD can support that much better than hemodialysis um, due to the due, due to the the very um, due to things like incremental peritoneal dialysis and of course being able to dialyze overnight and having your days free. Um, of course, if you have a good PD insertion team, then the ease of PD insertion for that correct timing can be, makes it more likely that you're going to get more patients onto urgent start PD. And of course you don't need embedded catheters. So as I've said, I just want to make that point again, do speak to your surgeons. If you don't have LAPD catheter insertion, speak to your surgeons and speak to them about minimal, minimally invasive technique, a good exit site, um, and, and making sure that um, it's, the catheter is less likely to leak because of the, ins uh, the insertion technique used under, with, uh, with a laparoscopic technique. So prescribing an acute PD. So at King's, we do have this step guide, and this is just to make things easier. This doesn't mean that we can't change the volumes. It doesn't mean that we can't change the fill volume. It doesn't mean that we can't change the cycles, but it does mean that if I put a catheter in at midnight on a Thursday evening, and that the team can easily commence the patient, and then we can look afterwards to see how the patient has done. And so, all of these things and having trolleys set up on the ward, making sure that your PD team and your nephrologist um, do training sessions and education sessions to make sure that everybody understands what you're trying to achieve when you set out to acutely dialyze a patient on PD. Um, these things can really help. Um, and that step, and, and when you're explaining it to the patient as well, talking to them about the steps of urgent PD is really important especially when it comes to family members, um, for them to understand that the end point is that the, pa is that the patient will go home and will be um, hopefully um, completing their own self-care, but if not, that they will have a team such as assisted peritoneal dialysis to help them at home to make sure that they can move to the next, um, the next point in their education and um, their independence. Please do not be afraid of hypertonic solutions if urgent UF is required. It's really important that you understand that it's absolutely fine to use green bags, 2.27%, or um, orange red bags, 3.86%, if you need to get an, um, a fast UF. Um, and patients will manage that UF very very well. Um, patients' blood pressures will remain very stable. Um, and do remember that this is still a very gentle form of dialysis. And of course, you can use balance solution as well and the Fresenius machine. I wanted to talk to you about our most recent um, urgent start patient. Um, and to all intents and purposes, if, if probably 10 years ago, this patient had come to King's, they probably wouldn't have been able to have urgent start PD. 
Um, English not being their first language, um, they had crash landed completely, had not been completely unheralded. Um, but this patient also had um, uh, polycystic kidneys, very large polycystic kidneys. Um, and so, but definitely wanted to work as a chef and wants to complete com uh, to keep working. Um, so this patient was uh, referred on the 29th, had their catheter put in on the 30th, having had having had good bowel prep, having had good skin cleansing, having had everything that that was possible to make sure that he didn't leak, etc. The catheter went in using cell digging technique, using ultrasound guidance, of course, to make sure that we could see those kidneys as we put that catheter in. Um, and as you can see very quickly, um, he has um, his, we have corrected um, most of his metabolic issues and uremic issues. Um, and he was actually discharged on, on Monday morning um, and is being followed up by the assisted team and is being trained this week how to do his own treatment. It is very possible, even with language barrier, even with um, the most difficult of um, circumstances to manage this very, very well. Um, so again, just to make the point, acute CAPD. So should the patient have any problems with, for instance, possible catheter migration, so not in the best space in the peritoneum, or, um, or indeed with, um, uh, um, catheter migration or, or constipation, then CAPD can sometimes work more successfully. Um, and please do consider that again in a supine position um, and consider the, the dwell volumes that you are using. So what's important? The most important thing about urgent start PD is to get that catheter in and get it in um, well and for the exit site to be in the correct place for the catheter to be working at the point of insertion. Um, so you do need to foster that relationship with the patient. And even though they're an, an acute um, referral, spending a little bit of time, an hour or so, to actually talk through all points of the pre-op preparation, exactly what having the catheter in is going to feel like, making sure that you get that informed consent and ensuring that, for instance, our patient was visited by our community team met by his wife and over the weekend, his wife prepared their home so that even in a bed sit, and they do live in a bed sit, and that includes their kitchen, et cetera, that they can actually manage to do APD at home. Um, but having all of those things in place does make things easier. And it of course sends a message straight to the patient that you care enough to actually go to their home whilst they are still in the hospital in order to make their dialysis possible. Preoptive care is very important and please do, Remember that even though you are putting the catheter in within 24 hours, you will still be able to do most of the preparation as set out here. Um, Pre-op um, IV vancomycin or, or any other broad spectrum antibiotic as, as per ISPD guidelines is really important. Continuing laxatives whilst the patient is on PD and especially APD. I mean, personal nasal cr cream, you can get two or three doses probably of that in before the patient needs to have the catheter in. Um, you don't need to starve the patient. They can have a light early breakfast and do consider anticoagulants. Ensure that you're stopping heparin. You're making sure that you are checking all of your um, pre-op bloods, in including anticoag screen and group and screen, et cetera. Pre-operative checklists are my friend. I put in PD catheters, a lot of them uh, per year. Um, and everyone, I like to make sure that the WHO pre-op checklist is complete and that will help you to remain safe within your practice. Please put in the right catheter. It is definitely not a one size fits all. Um, we generally use 57 and 62 centimeter catheters, but we have 42 and other lengths of catheters to ensure that the patient has the right catheter in place. Preoptive mapping is really important. Make sure you take time to bring the catheter you feel will fit and make sure it is the correct catheter and that it is sitting um, in the appropriate place, which is five centimeters below the upper border of the pubic symphysis. And that exercise should be upward facing. It should be no more than two to three centimeters from the distal dacron cuff. These things are all very important in ensuring that the catheter drains well. Sit the patient up to mark them. Don't mark them in bed because the landscape of their abdomen will be completely different and ensure that you have a dedicated access team. So that dedicated access team could be a nurse like myself. It could be any operator. It could be 
It could indeed be maybe um, a, an interventionalist, a radiologist, um, but the point is that all of these things have taken place before the catheter has been inserted um, and that the protocol has been followed. It is shortened because you're doing it acutely, but it doesn't mean that you can't do most of it. And as we can see, um, antibiotics pre-catheter as per PDOPS is very, very important in reducing infection risk. And that's why we see a very low post-op infection rate in any of our urgent start PD patients. You need very little equipment in order to be able to put in urgent start PD catheters. You need a hands-free sink. And these are literally the items that we use for putting in a PD catheter apart from either a PD effluent bag or saline, which is what we use. Um, a local anesthetic and preferably a local anesthetic with some lignocaine um, to prevent bleed, uh, with some adrenaline to prevent bleeding, um, such as xylocaine 2% with adrenaline, which is what we use. We use a midline incision and a very small midline incision. It really depends on how big your fingers are, really how, how big that incision needs to be. Um, and all you're trying to do is to then blunt dissect down to the linear alba. You insert the needle and that that needle can be either a cannula or it can be a, a steel um, straight needle, which is what we use, a 16 gauge. Um, and all you're trying to do is to um, get the tip of the needle into the peritoneum so that you can then get your guide wire in safely. Um, what we tend to do is to create a little bit of artificial ascites. This can be done by attaching um, a fluid bag or a saline bag, or as we can see here, we are just infusing it um, for ease. Um, you insert your guide wire. Your guide wire is your friend. Once your guide wire is in, you know that, and it's passing without any, um, any problems, you know that you can then use your dilator to create space for the catheter and the peel away sheath. We always aimed a dilator and the peel away sheet toward the left iliac fossa, although I did not do that at the weekend because of this patient's um, very large polycystic kidneys. But otherwise, that is the best way to get the catheter into a good space. Providing individualized post-op care is really important. Um, and for this patient in particular, obviously avoiding his tattoo was important, but that actually managed to get, uh, we actually managed to get his exit site in a particularly lovely space um, whilst doing that. But it is important. We tend to use a bio patch. You can use any other um, um, antibiotic um, impregnated dressing, but the important thing is that you have that loop of slack and that that catheter is completely immobilized and remains immobilized and taking time to actually immobilize that catheter before they go to the, to the ward to actually have their dialysis is a very important part of this process. Please do not take down the dressing every time you see the patient on the ward. There's no need and you're most likely going to give the patient an infection by, do, by over surveilling that exit site. There should, unless, you, unless there is a lot of bleeding or you suspect infection please leave it alone. Consider face masks in patients with persistent coughs. And certainly when we take patients into our procedure room, they all wear a mask and that will help um, prevent infection in that way as well. Laxatives, patency, get personal with the patient, understand what they eat, understand their diet, understand why if they're constipated, they might be and how we can, um, how we can prevent that. Make sure that you are looking at your ISPD guidelines for your post-implant care. Um, and, and it is important to consider how you are going to continue looking after that patient and actually educating that patient. Because as we know, any patient, whether they go on HD or PD, urgent start patients need a higher level of education and extra time post-implant. Um, um, be sure that you have written guidance, that you have guidance that has photographs that you have guidance that might be a video. Um, it is important that the patient has access to various um, forms of guidance to make sure that that um, catheter remains, um, remains patent and also remains infection free. Be kind to your patient, give analgesia as required, but avoid opiate, opiates if you can, because they, they will constipate your patient. Um, keep the dressing intact for seven days. There was really no need to take it down. I always flush our catheters before we use them with 500 mils in and out two or three times, and I'll leave 500 mils in. The reason for this is just to provide confidence for the patient and for the team caring for the patient that it's actually working. Um, do not 
walk while you're dwelling or sit above 45 degrees. Whenever we have had a PD um, exit site leak, it has invariably been, been due to the fact that the patient has gotten up and had a walk whilst on the machine. And so as long as a patient, their relatives and the team understands that shouldn't happen. You will get complications as, as Brett has explained. And some of the most often, the, the, the most popular complication is constipation requiring the catheter to possibly be um, repositioned. Um, and if you put your catheters in using cell dinger technique, you can reposition them using cell dinger technique by just wiring the catheter in this way. You bring the catheter through, making sure that it is, it is, it is kept clean and certainly is, in, on, is on completely aseptic technique. And then you can place your catheter back through your peel away sheet, having used your dilator over your, over your wire again. And as you can see, this patient is leaking fluid because that fluid wants to come out. Um, and again, often if we have a problem, this is a very simple way of resolving that. So don't give up and thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, well thank you, Brett and Elaine for two excellent talks. Um, both reviewing all, all the literature, giving us the clinical background, and also the really important practical hands-on getting that catheter in, do, doing the prescriptions. So if people have got questions, please put them into the um, question and answer um, box, um, and I'm keeping a, a regular look at them. Um, so there's some questions that, that have already come through. One, one I think is probably a very quick question, and that is, um, and it's probably very relevant to lower income countries where hepatitis is more common, say, than in, in, um, in England, is does the PD outflow transmit hepatitis? So, Brett, can you answer that? Okay, so yeah, unfortunately, it, it does. So, PD, PD effluent does, does contain hepatitis virus, especially hepatitis B. Um, so you have to warn patients from the beginning and also important to warn staff, um, especially if you're doing urgent start PD on the wards. Um, you're, you may have nurses that are not PD trained who pick up the bags and take them to dispose of them. So they, you, they, they do need to be warned if it's a hepatitis positive patient. However, it's still a very good modality of, of treating these patients with, um, as long as they're taught how to dispose of their PD effluent appropriately. Um, actually, it, it puts fewer dialysis nurses at risk, um, puts fewer patients um, in the dialysis unit at risk. Uh, many low-income countries don't have isolation facilities for hepatitis B, and hepatitis B can be easily transmitted through a dialysis unit if they're not isolated. So urgent start PD is actually one of our, uh, one of our you know, it's one of the indications of hepatitis um, for urgent start PD. When the patients are at home, we do teach them how to dispose of the fluid and then um, they actually will either burn the bags um, themselves so that they, um, they don't get thrown away in municipal waste dumps or preferably if we can, we supply them with, uh, with red bags and they get disposed of at the hospital. Well, thank you very much. So I'm not going to go over the questions about prescribing because I suspect they were mostly written before Elaine did her excellent overview on how you prescribe PD. But there's one really important question here, and it's really about who do you choose or how do you choose to put somebody onto um, using urgent start PD? And that was, do you make sure that the home situation is good for PD before you start urgent PD in the hospital? So Elaine, do you want to address that question? So as much as possible, we would try to make sure that the patient could leave and go home on acute PD. But there are various there are variations, especially with a patient with AKI. I think the thing to consider is how much absolute consent do we get from patients to put them on HD? And, and we often don't consider that. With PD, in order to do acute PD, we definitely use a more formal consent pathway um, and we make sure that um, we try to visit the patient if possible. If not, um, the wonderful WhatsApp is there and you can get a patient's relative to wander around their house with the WhatsApp video on and we can identify areas where people can um, store their fluid, we can look at their bathrooms, we can give them advice about clearing up and where they might put things. 
Um, we've sent pe people off to Ikea to get just the right stand for the machine, etc. Things can be done remotely. And in this remote world, we can do a great deal. What I would say is that if you're looking for the per perfect patient for urgent start PD, they don't exist. Our job is to make it possible. That's our only job. And it's something that we should just put our put our 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 efforts into and I think that's the point if you put your efforts into that and you have a team that are sold that are sold on doing that things become easier and easier and we get much slicker at, at, at looking at these things and getting them done in a very short time okay so there's another question that's here that's it's about um, is there any utility in using fibrin glue application on the inner cuff by the surgeon at the time of double cuff PD catheter insertion to prevent leaks. Has any, either of you got any experience of that? There, want to comment? There, there is, there's, there's certainly, that, I mean, there's evidence that fibrin glue can, can prevent, or if you have got a leak, that you can use it to seal a leak. Um, I'm not aware of any, any data on using it prophylactically. Um, certainly, it, it, so, if, you know, Lane's talked about putting the PD catheter in percutaneously, and I agree with her 100%. I think for an urgent start PD program, that should be your default, if possible, that the catheters are put in percutaneously. Um, with the dilation technique, there's very seldom that they do leak. And, um, and I, my experience has been with surgically placed catheters that there's a much higher risk of them leaking. Even if they're put in laparoscopically, the laparoscopic ports, even if they're sutured, quite often they're the point of leak. Um, but if, if you have got a surgeon who's putting them in, um, it's, it's really important that you talk to them about closing their port sites. So they've got to close those from inside. Um, and also, if possible, they, they're putting in purse string sutures around the, um, around the cuff um, to try and prevent a leak. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, I think get to know your surgeons, go into surgery with them. Um, our surgeons use Seldinger technique and laparoscopic technique together, and that way we can use urgent start very easily. Um, and certainly within 12 hours, you might not use it within an hour, but you can use it within 12 hours. And mostly most patients can be medically managed until then. Okay, so there are quite a few questions about selection of patients for urgent start PD. And are there any um, cutoffs of urea, potassium, or anything that you would decide that really this patient would need urgent hemo rather than urgent start PD? So, Brett, what would? Yeah, so I think, look, you know, the problem with, with PD is the risk is that you put a PD catheter in and the PD catheter doesn't work. And you, if you've got a patient who's got a potassium of 7.5, you don't want to be in that position. So if you have the opportunity to hemodialyze those patients, um, if their potassium can't be corrected, um, then they should, be, they should be hemodialyzed. The patient who is acutely unwell um, with acidosis, um, hypotensive, yeah, you want to, to, to do some sort of extracorporeal therapy if you want to be 100% sure. Having said that, in, in many places around the world, getting a patient onto acute dialysis might take you six to 12 hours because there's no machine available, you don't have CVVHD available. And in all of those cases, if you start them on acute PD, often you'll have their potassium down within a few hours. So it's not a contraindication, but in a patient who is profoundly hyperkalemic, fluid overloaded or acidotic, um, if you have got easy access to an extracorporeal therapy, I would suggest you do that first. And you can put your PD catheter in the next day. There's no problem with doing that or in a couple of days. Okay, um, so there's, there's quite a few questions coming through about the actual prescribing, and I'm going to roll them in, into, into one. So there's one about, have you seen that is hyperglycemia a problem um, in people with, with urgent start PD? And there's also a question about using tidal PD. Could that cause fluid overload because of reabsorption with high hydrostatic pressure? So Elaine, do you want to start? So um, if, you're, if you're starting with a patient who is hyperglycemic, um, the important thing to do is whilst, you're whilst that patient is having acute PD is to make sure that they have a sliding scale running whilst they do that. Manage the hypoglycemia. You mean sliding that scale of, in, of insulin? Yeah. 
Yes. Um, they, if you, if you can manage that, mostly you won't need to use hypertonic solutions, but if you do need to use hypertonic solutions, you can keep an eye on the blood sugar. But to be honest, it is a very rare complication of acute PD. Um, secondly, when it comes to tidal, tidal does work really, really well, but of course the machine will let you know if you are not draining off the expected volume um, of uh, PD fluid. And people do worry about um, uh, um, overfilling of the peritoneum if the catheter doesn't, isn't working. Um, urokinase um, and, and heparin, if the patient is, is shedding some protein from their peritoneum is, is quite useful. Um, but we've, we've never seen a patient get into trouble with um, too much retained fluid and overfilling with acute PD. Um, usually um, UF can be achieved. You just need to be, you need to be um, okay with using those hypertonic solutions. And I think Brett, you would agree, um, just use what you need to use in order to achieve your UF. The tidal volume, it is less efficient and sometimes it's not required and, and you can reduce it very quickly. So some, we will always start, especially, um, so drain pain feels a bit like menstrual pain. So we do find that ladies don't get too agitated by it, but gentlemen, because they haven't felt that before, it can be quite off-putting. And then the, the you don't want the patient to be put off the treatment in, in the first kind of 12 hours of treatment. So do let them know that they're probably going to get some drain pain. Do use Tidal um, and think about your volumes and your percentages. And so, Brett, before you answer, do you think you could also talk about urgent start in low resource situations where APD is not possible? Sure. So just going back to the title, title, and this probably does lead into, into um, in the low resource setting. It, I, often I've found that patients, they may still have mechanical complications, even though you use a tidal volume. The, the idea is that you, you're less likely to get mechanical complications with the tidal PD. Um, and that's where I find CAPD is actually often more helpful. These patients might just have a slightly slower drainage because they, the catheter is getting into the right position. And often just changing them over to CAPD in that position in that situation will sort it out. Um, the other thing is that sometimes you need to increase the fill volumes as well. If you've got small fill volumes, sometimes your mechanical complications go up. Obviously, you don't want to increase them too much that you then end up with a leak. As far as low resource settings are concerned, we routinely teach people how to do acute PD for AKI using CAPD. Um, you would use a manual bag and um, normally would do two hourly exchanges and um, you obviously not going to be able to do a tidal type PD with that but you're using a manual bag and you're able to see when you're draining out draining in so so manual acute PD is is certainly a great option it's what we use routinely for AKI um, but also what we would use for our urgent starters and that patient I presented at the beginning he was treated with urgent start CAPD rather than urgent start APD. Um, so it's certainly feasible. So uh, leading on from that, there's a question which I think Elaine would approve of about um, experience of nurses putting in catheters in low resource settings, um, because it, that can be very challenging to, 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 to get the catheter in. So I mean, have you got I've, any I've, experience about training people in low resource settings? I think it can be very challenging and unfortunately it's often because the nursing hierarchy um, may find barriers to actual to that kind of um, advanced practice with with nursing teams the thing is it really doesn't matter if it's a nurse or if it's a doctor or if it's an interventional radiologist it just needs to be somebody who has been trained is competent and is allowed to get the experience required to actually get better at this and um, responding to one of the earlier questions, the, real, the reality is the more proficient you get at doing something, um, the more borderline patients that you will actually be able to take on to your, take on because you have the experience to look after patients who, who have very high uh, ureas, who have um, uh, very... Uh, um, who need a lot of UF, et cetera, in the first instance. I think 
what is important is that you you change your prescription so don't just stay on the same prescription because because that's where you started at and certainly we we started with always having a liter fill volume and i would agree brett when we when we went to 1200 or 1500 mils we had many, much less problems with uh, mechanical problems and if you have mechanical problems get rid of the machine and do capd no more mechanical okay. problems. So, so we're, get, we're getting near the end of time. I'm just going to say that the ISPD Nursing Committee is going to be um, producing some recommendations about nurse insertion um, and training for PD catheter insertions. Uh, it, there's an interesting question here about using urgent start PD for poisonings, insecticides, pesticides, etc. cetera. Um, if you've got, you want to say anything? Yeah, I think, uh, look, the, yeah. sorry, I was going to say there was a very good talk at the ISP, uh, at, at ISPD in regards to things like snake bites, etc. And apparently it is used very successfully um, for those reasons. I'll let Brett talk some more about that. Yeah, look, it, it, it certainly is an option. Um, things like polyethylene glycol are better cleared by um, uh, hemodialysis. And um, so we'd prefer to use extracorporeal therapies for, um, for poisonings. Um, but it has, as Elaine says, it's been used um, in a number of, a number of case controls um, studies, as a number of sort of case series, so um, it's been used to treat poisonings um, and as, as it does remove some of the, the toxin. But I would, I would err on the side of using um, extracorporeal therapies for most of those. So I'm going to, where time is up, I'm going to draw things to a close at this point. There are a whole range of questions about catheter insertions, um, and I have not addressed those. Um, I think what um, we, I will take away to the ISPD Education Committee is that we need a webinar on catheter insertion um, directly, so we can go in much more depth about exit site care how you make that exit site, et cetera, et cetera. So I haven't ignored you. I've taken on the message that we need to do, produce a webinar on this topic. These, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on both the ISN website and on the ISPD YouTube site um, for people to look at afterwards. And I would like to thank um, both Brett and Elaine for two excellent talks um, and and really in, and you, the audience, for having so many, you know, quite difficult and tricky and really important functional questions, uh, and and hopefully you will all take away the message that urgent start PD is something that can be done, should be done, um, and will make PD much more accessible um, to to the people that we look after. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to the ISN. Um, for the technical support um, for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.